So I'm still mooning over these Macs, you know? Like these M1 chips are incredible. And I know a lot of you have watched a ton of reviews on them already, but if there's one thing you can do, and if you can do it because you have access to it, is go to an Apple store, if they're open in wherever you live in the world, and just try it for yourself, you know? Try these computers for yourself because these are something different. Not so much the design, the look and feel, they're still incredible, but it's so much the M1 chip. You know, this is a huge jump in computing. The fact that Apple was able to cram so much performance in such a low power chip, it just makes everything else look different. Now you're probably looking at the MacBook Pro 13 and Air and not sure which one to get because at the end of the day, the processors are fairly similar. They're both M1s and depending if you get the base model in the MacBook Air, it either comes with seven or eight GPU cores, which is very similar to the MacBook Pro 13. If you talk about design, they're the same. You know, they're very much the same, a little bit lighter with the MacBook Air at 2.8 pounds compared to three, and it's a bit thinner too. Now, a lot of people hate on the touch bar. I don't mind it. I, I don't see its purpose. I don't value its purpose. I'd rather have a proper row like you do on the MacBook Air, but that's a feature or not a feature you get with the MacBook Pro 13. The speakers. They're fantastic on both of these laptops, but you get studio grade stereo speakers with the MacBook Pro 13, which do sound a bit better. The cool thing is both of these laptops come with three microphones, they're beam forming, but the MacBook Pro 13 are studio quality. This is the microphone on the MacBook Air. This is the microphone on the MacBook Air. Right now you're listening to the quality of the microphones on the MacBook Air. This is what the microphone sounds like on the MacBook Pro 13. You are listening to the microphones from the MacBook Pro 13. So display is one area where they share a lot of similarities. They're both 13.3 inches, the color gamut and color accuracy is all equal. It really comes down to just brightness. 400 nits on the MacBook Air, which is 50 nits higher than the previous MacBook Air and 500 nits on the MacBook Pro 13. I honestly don't think it makes that much of a difference if you're indoors. And quite frankly, a lot of video editors edit in a very dark room and lower the screen brightness to about 250. Plus none of these displays are HDR. So using that higher brightness is not gonna come in handy. The only time it does make a difference is if you're outdoors. 100 nits brighter display will make you see the display easier in direct sunlight. But honestly, the best thing about these brand new Macs is the stuff they're able to do with performance. Like these five nanometer chips are killing it in single core clock speeds, beating everything. 45 watt CPUs, the best AMD CPUs. It's super impressive. Multi-core is a bit of a different story. This is still remarkable. Like it's going neck and neck with the MacBook Pro 16, which is using an eight core 45 watt CPU. That's unheard of. And then you take actual real life use cases. You know, you're, you're a video editor and you're using Final Cut Pro. I was able to do a multi-cam 4K edit in Final Cut Pro and it was so smooth. Now, not everyone uses Final Cut Pro and I get it. I, I personally use Premiere Pro and it runs on this. It's a little slow to load up, but once you're in, you can move around the timeline just fine. The only thing that Premiere Pro suffers on right now because it's not optimized for Apple Silicon is render times. You know, it takes a very long time to render a file compared to Final Cut, but this is gonna change. Adobe will eventually update Premiere Pro and you will see better results. Same with DaVinci Resolve. They're in beta with their Apple Silicon version. I also installed Chrome the Intel version, and then they updated a few days later to the Apple Silicon one, and it's amazing. It flies, it's fast. I don't understand how this is happening with just eight gigabytes of RAM. Now I do have some theories, maybe because the RAM is unified, it's able to access the CPU faster, which means data doesn't need to be stored in RAM as long because it's moving so quickly, but either way, it's impressive. Now developers, you guys asked me three things. You asked me if I could compile Mozilla Firefox, and I could not. Homebrew will not install, but I did get Mac ports to work, but when it came to compile time, it failed. The other thing was VirtualBox. It does install on these M1 chips, but you can't load any operating systems. It's just not available yet. And finally was display support. You can only hook up one display to the MacBook Pro or MacBook Air, even though there's two 
Thunderbolt ports. Only one display will work, plus sidecar on an iPad. If you want more than one display with an M1 chip, you have to buy the Mac Mini. You can connect one display to the Type-C port and another display to the HDMI port. And I did touch on gaming with the MacBook Pro 13. Obviously, this is an integrated GPU. It's not going to blow away the 5500M and the MacBook Pro 16, but this is the fastest integrated GPU I've tested, period. I played World of Warcraft. I showed you in my previous video, and some of you said, well, Matt, this is a very old game. But for those of you that play World of Warcraft, know for a fact it's poorly optimized. And once you start turning on settings and increasing filters, it becomes very demanding. And I was able to do that on this integrated GPU. Now this is the Apple Silicon version that I used and it just runs beautifully. Same with League of Legends. It also runs great too. And I can show you more. Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Sure, it's getting 30 frames per second, but that's double of what the Intel version of the MacBook Pro 13 can do. But this is not only it. It's the fan noise, you know? You hop on to the MacBook Air, it's silent all the time because there's no fan inside. You hop on to the MacBook Pro 13, you can't hear anything. And even after 10 minutes of sustained use of something pounding it, the fans will kick on, but you can barely hear it. Heat is a non-issue. These things never get that hot. The, 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 the deck of these keyboards only get up to like 42 to 43 degrees Celsius, which is remarkable. But the battery life is what really speaks to me, you know? I pounded these things and I was easily getting eight to 10 hours of use before needing to charge. You put these things on idle, they'll last days before draining the battery. Very similar to the iPhone. But I still think if you're looking at the MacBook Air and the Pro, you should probably just go for the Air. Apple's gonna be accelerating these M1 chips in the future. And I feel like most people buying an Ultrabook are not sitting doing Final Cut or Adobe Premiere Pro all day. It's just the fact that these tiny little things with their efficient processors can actually do it. If you're a pro user, wait for the MacBook Pro 16 with the optimized, more powerful version of the M1 or possibly an M2 with a dedicated GPU because by God, AMD and Intel are gonna be scared because that machine is going to be insane. So yeah, if you're buying a MacBook today, just get the Air because I feel like for $300 extra, the Pro 13 doesn't really warrant a reason to buy it, especially at the rate that Apple's going to accelerate future M processors. I hope that helped you make a decision. And if you have any more questions, let me know in the comment section down below or hop on Discord and I'd be happy to answer them. Like the video if you liked it, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys in the next video.